Hi, everyone. We're back for another show. And as you can tell from the intro music today, it's a little bit different than other ones that we've been doing. Uh, that might have sounded like some Olympic music to you. Well, that's because it is. Because as you can see on the screen, uh, we have uh, an Olympic swimmer with us, Elizabeth Beisel. Um, we'll explain what that has to do with music uh, in a little bit if you haven't seen any of the other interviews that we've done with her. Um, but Elizabeth, thank you so much for joining us. Mark, thanks for having me. It's always so good to see you and talk to you and catch up. So I'm yeah, it, happy to be here. it's great to see you. And, and what's strange is we were actually supposed to be seeing each other in person uh, today and tomorrow uh, at, the, at the Pennsylvania Music Educators Association conference. But then obviously we're all stuck in our houses and living on Zoom. Right. <laughs> so Zoom it is. For yeah, today. Zoom it is. But Zoom it is temporary replacement. But. Absolutely. Uh, so let's let's give the quick bio of, of, uh, of who you are, okay? Um, Three-time Olympian, two-time medalist uh, in swimming. Do you want to give the quick bio of, uh, of what you've done in your swimming career? Yeah, I'll give a little quick rundown. Um, so was a competitive swimmer for 20 years from ages 5 to 25. Um, I went to three Olympics. I was 15 at my first, 19 at my second, and 23 at my third. Um, I have a couple of world championship medals, Olympic medals. Um, and yeah, it's, it's kind of been who I am. Um, but now I'm no longer a swimmer and I'm getting more into the broadcasting side of swimming, which I'm really enjoying because swimming is the sport that I love and know best. And I love being in front of people and I love the adrenaline rush of being on camera or reporting about a sport that I really like. So I'm slowly turning that page into a new chapter, but for right now, I'm staying put because I can't really do any of that right now. So I'm, I'm really just trying to enjoy slowing down for once. Um, obviously, I'm not swimming anymore, so it doesn't really matter that I'm not training, um, but my heart does go out to all of those athletes that are quarantined right now and at a stay-at-home stay order um, who don't have access to their pool or whatever it is that they need to train um, because it is a tough time to be an athlete right now but i'm i'm past that chapter of my life so yeah swimming was a huge part of who i am was still am um and very happy that i can i can be here today and so you are keeping busy during quarantine i actually was just on a webinar that that you're doing once a week um which is a little way i guess for you to work on your broadcasting career and have some fun and then get to hang out and chat with friends too yeah the webinar have been awesome. So I've been hosting one every single Wednesday um, from 2 to 3 p.m. It's called Silver Lining Live. Um, and I get on guest swimmers, whether they were Olympians or national champions. And it's a way for kids, coaches, parents to just join into a Zoom meeting and get some inspiration and kill an hour. Because um, mm -hmm. we honestly have a lot of time on our hands right now. But it's just a way to engage with kids. Today on, on the one that I was on earlier, we had all over 3,000 people yeah. tune in, which is pretty huge um, in the swimming world. So it's been nice to bring joy to people despite the circumstances that it's under. So I've been having a lot of fun with it. And that's every Wednesday afternoon? Yep, Wednesday afternoon from 2 to 3 p.m. All right, we, we will put the link up for that um, so people can see that. So, okay, so it's called Silver Lining Live, and that might have something to do with this. <laughs> Silver lining the I love book. That you have that on cue. Absolutely, yeah. All right. So the actual book here uh, that that you wrote that came out um, just uh, what two months ago now, I guess. Yeah, a little bit over two months ago. Um, so the book title was Silver Lining, hence Silver Lining Live. Um, but it was it was kind of an exploratory way for me to get all of my stories and memories from my swimming career on paper, as well as music. Um, and I, that's kind of where Mark and I have our little connection is music and the Olympics. But yeah, it, it goes through my entire Olympic and swimming career um, with a little bit of music kind of sprinkled in there because music was a huge part of my swimming career in a, in a different way than many of you guys would probably think. But it was really fun to write the book and it's been received really well, especially right now. Again, the circumstances aren't great, but people aren't really doing anything at home, so they're reading more, um, which has meant good things for my book, and hopefully people can pull some inspiration from that and help get, help that, hopefully the book will help them get through this hard time, um, because I think we do all need a little pick-me-up right now. 
Yeah, that's what I loved about the book, that it, it, it was a lot of those great behind the scenes stories that we all enjoy in books like this, but it was so inspirational and you were so open with, hey, I was crushed when this happened, but what I really like about what you did is you say, yes, I was crushed, but this is what I did and how I, I picked up from that point. Yeah, and, and I think that's a huge theme in all of our lives is that everything, we can't control everything, right? And adversity is going to come our way. And it's kind of how we react to it that determines the outcome that we choose to see. And so for me, there were plenty of times in my swimming career where I was knocked off my feet or I felt like I failed. And silver lining comes into it because I tried to find the silver lining in every bad thing that happened to me in my swimming career. Um, and I think it's a good message, especially, especially right now um, with the day and age that we're living in is, all right, I'm going to control what I can control. I'm going to try to make the most out of this time that we have right now. And, and this is obviously going towards the people that aren't frontline workers. Um, you know, I'm just kind of sitting at my home twiddling my thumbs, but trying to make use of this time that I don't normally get on an everyday basis and trying to make the best of it. I, I love, there's lots of factoids in this book that I love, but my favorite was, okay, your nickname from your violin teacher was Vivace. So yeah. it means fast, right? And what you go and do, your goal, and, and what you kind of focus your career on is being fast in the pool. Um, but there's a lot of great little music quips in here. Um, and so we're not just saying this is a hobby. Like, you were really good and still are really good. I've heard you play in person. I mean, you're, you're a very good violin player. You play the guitar. You sing. I mean, multi-talented when it comes to music. Yeah, so music was actually my first love. Um, I started playing violin when I was three years old, and I started swimming when I was five, so it was kind of the first thing that I really liked to do, and I think swimming took the front seat for such a long time, and my violin playing probably peaked when I was in high school, because that's when I was practicing every day, and you're right on the Vivace thing. My teacher, Mr. Dempsey, um, he would literally make me practice with a metronome for hours on end. Like every time I had a lesson with him, if I started to rush even a little bit, and that was like my name of the game, he'd be like, we're putting on the net, the metronome. And I was like, no, please, no, I promise I won't rush. But it was funny because like literally everything in my life, I had to be the best at or the fastest at. And it just shined through everything that I did, including playing the violin. And he could just never seem to slow me down. So, well, but that worked out for you in the pool, though. That was good. That was your it mindset. Did, but right. All of you mu musicians, don't rush. Right, right, don't right. Rush. <laughs> right. Um, so, one of the other really cool things that that uh, NBC has done during quarantine is they've been replaying the Olympics, um, which I just love. Um, and we're, we're going to get to talk about the Olympics uh, being postponed here in a minute, but I'm really loving it. And what you've done and some other athlete, athletes have done is you've gone on and you've done some Instagram lives uh, as they've been playing. Um, one night you did all the whole women swimming, one night you did just, you know, when your race was on. And it's, it's, I love it because you're like, here's what it is. Here's what I was thinking. And here was the high moment and here was the low moment. And, and I think that's really important for people to, to be exposed to that. It's, we can't always be at the top and that's okay. And I think that's one thing that swimmers, honestly, all Olympic athletes um, kind of have to deal with is we're put on this pedestal because we're Olympians, right? But we're also human. And so I remember when I was little watching the Olympics, you know, I would watch my idols swim and I'd be like, they never get nervous or, you know, they never mess up. And now that I am one of those Olympians, the reality is, we make the same mistakes everybody else does. And so it's been cool for me to rewatch these Olympics um, because I've actually never watched them on TV because I've been swimming. Like I've been there doing yeah, it. Been, you've been busy, you know, yeah. Right. I've seen the races online, like on a YouTube clip, but I've never watched it like commentated and being live on TV. So it was really cool for me personally to watch them and then be able to give everybody else, you know, what I was thinking when I stepped up on the blocks or what I was thinking at this point in my race and you know, the doubts and the fears that go through all of our minds at the Olympics hopefully can help other athletes or even musicians who are about to get on stage and perform understand that nerves are okay and doubts are okay. As long as you don't let them debilitate you and your ability to perform. Right. 
Right. That's absolutely, it's amazing the parallels. I mean, you, in, just in the webinar, you were talking about the parallels, the swimming and stand-up comedy, and, the, and the, now the parallels, the swimming and music, for sure. Um, so let's talk a little about the, the Olympics, the, what were to be the 2020 Games, um, you know, being canceled, the, the plan is to be postponed until next year. Um, I'm curious from somebody who went to three consecutive Olympic games, there's, you know, a lot of people might only follow the Olympics and not kind of follow what happens in between. Um, I've started to follow of, over the past probably 10 years or so, if not a little longer, uh, swimming a lot more and what's the in between and I see there's these very specific defined points of this happens on the two year mark and and mm -hmm. well now we're thrown into a tizzy so we're thrown into this is a five year gap between Olympics number one and athletes are in quarantine so I'm curious for what your reaction is and I'm sure you've talked to some friends who are planning to go to the Olympics what how are they handling this and how does that kind of throw the whole bigger picture out of whack yeah, it, it throws everything out of whack because especially for Olympic sport athletes like swimmers or track and field runners or, you know, sports that are predominantly showcased at the Olympic Games, this is a huge wrench into our plans because we're based on a four-year cycle. We call it the quad. And every four years we have that Olympic Games and it's like clockwork. And our bodies are almost taught to behave on that four-year cycle where we know on year one of the four year cycle, that's predominantly, you know, a rest year. It's the year right after the Olympics. So we kind of chill, we're still swimming, but it's not as intense. And then as the years build closer to that fourth year, we're in prime condition for those Olympics. And so you're talking these Olympics being postponed a few weeks ago. That's when we as swimmers and as athletes are in our best shape. You know, we're competing in the Olympics in three to four months we're ready to go. And now with them being postponed, you're asking us to train at that same level for another 18 months. It's nearly impossible. I've never done it. I don't think anybody has done it. So I, I feel for the older athletes, you know, my friends like Ryan Lochte, he's 36 years old right now. Another 18 months for him, it may not seem like a lot to you guys, but in his world, 18 months could either determine him making the team or not and you know for those youngsters they're only getting faster with another 18 months because they're still growing so it kind of introduces a whole new crop of athletes that you may not have even heard of this summer hmm. but now that it's next summer they might take over the Ryan Lochte spot that he would have had this summer so it, it, it really is just so complicated and I know that the athletes especially swimmers because we don't have a pool to just go to right are trying to simulate ways that are kind of like swimming on land, but at the end of the day, it's not the same. Um, so I'm lucky enough that I'm not a swimmer anymore and I'm not competing, so I don't really need to worry about that, but I am still very close friends with a lot of these athletes that are kind of thinking, have I just wasted the last four to five years of my life training for an Olympics that I'm not going to make? And that's, that's just like a gut wrenching feeling that I, I can't imagine how they're dealing with that. Right. Right. Uh, well, there's so many uncertainties and, uh, that this is another one of, of how does that, uh, how does that play out? Um, let's bring it back to music here. So, um, if you, if you follow, uh, Elizabeth's social media and we'll, we'll put the, the handles up, um, you see, you are making music during quarantine time. You're, you're keeping busy making music. So that it, it, it's a lifelong thing. Um, you know, how are you keeping busy with music even now uh, during this crazy time? Music has been the blessing for me during this quarantine. I feel like once I stopped swimming, I kind of slowly snuck back into the music world, but not, not 100%. Maybe I had one foot in, one foot out. Uh, but now with the time that I have in quarantine, it's kind of like, oh my gosh, I'm so bored. Why don't I just pick up the violin and play for a couple hours or the guitar or the piano or whatever it is that I feel like doing, I now have the time to do it. And it's amazing, you know, like I'm, I'm not great at guitar. I'm sort of teaching myself, but I'm having a blast doing it. And that's one of the best things that music has given me is honestly just an escape from boredom or a lack of something to do. And it brings me joy and happiness in a time where that's not exactly always there. 
Um, and so music for me during this quarantine has been everything and I've enjoyed every minute of it. And it's just such a thrill to be able to pick up the violin any time of day and be able to play it. And I don't normally have that luxury. So it's been really, really fun. So that, that kind of then goes into my next question of, so what's, what's your takeaway advice for the, the teachers out there that are trying to do online teaching and parents that are trying to deal with, with that and, and when it comes to music and then kids who are there trying to do music at home when they're used to being in an ensemble? Um, you know, we say stick with it, but it might carry a little more weight when it comes from you. Stick with it, <laughs> honestly. I mean, for me, I never would have thought that music would have brought me this much joy, um, especially during the time that we're in right now. And so what I would say to the students, the teachers, the parents, music is one of those things that's a universal language. And we don't really have that. And during a time like this, we need things that bring us together. And for me, that's been music. You know, I'm playing it for my family, for my friends virtually. I'm posting videos. And it's just those little nuggets of happiness that I get from music. And you know, it's also an opportunity to get better and to practice yeah. more. You know, this is like the ideal scenario. You have nothing going on. So you might as well take advantage of this time and work on your instrument or pick up a new instrument that you happen to have at home that you've been staring at for the past three years. You know what I mean? Like broaden your horizons and really enjoy this opportunity to play more music. Absolutely. And, and so in the past, you and I have talked a little bit about uh, music making at the Olympics. We don't really have time to go into that today, but we'll post the links to those interviews if you want to hear some more in-depth stuff um, about uh, some great kind of behind the scenes stories of how music played into the Olympics. Um, Elizabeth, thank you so much uh, for joining us to do this today. Uh, unfortunately, virtually, but I can't wait to see you in person again. Uh, and I'm sure you're ready to get out of the house as well. Oh my gosh, we all are at this point. Mark, thank you so much for having me. And guys, everybody, play your instruments. Do it now. Pick it up right now. It's I'm about to go play violin. So I hope you all are enjoying this time. Thank there, you, That's the quote of the day. Thank you, yeah. Elizabeth. Uh, <laughs> thanks for joining us, everyone. Uh, we'll be back next week with another two episodes. Uh, stay tuned for those, and we will see you then.